Shabbat Shalom! Shabbat Shalom! All right, praise God for another Shabbat. Um, wow, it's, it's been a very interesting week for my family and I. We've definitely kind of been going through the ringer, and I've been tied up with a lot of different things this week uh, in just life, and then in Scripture and other things. Just uh, I, I knew I was going to preach this Shabbat, um, but to be completely honest, I, I really didn't have a message at all until the very last minute, and, and you guys even saw me <laughs> finishing up uh, just before we, you know, finished dancing, and some of you guys were like, you're crazy, what are you going to do? Um, but I really believe that uh, y'all kind of laid this on me last night, and it's, it's something that I've been wanting to get into for a while now, um, but I, I just haven't gotten around to doing it, and so... Uh, but like last night, I was like, do it. And I was like, okay. Um, so the seven ecclesia of Revelation is what we're going to be getting into. And um, ecclesia is the Greek word that, where we get the word uh, church from. Uh, but if we go through scriptures, church isn't in there. Uh, the word church is derived from its origins. I'm not really sure. Where's the Latin word for circus. Uh, the Latin word for circus so it's not even a proper translation of the word ecclesia. Ecclesia just means uh, people seven. gathering, congregation, and so uh, that's why it's titled the seven ecclesia of Revelation instead of the seven churches of Revelation because uh, we're not a part of a circus. All right, at least some, at least some of us aren't. Right. <laughs> at least we try not to be. Assembly would be the most accurate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or congregation. Right? Or um, congregation, yeah. But with that being said, no, just going through Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, uh, I really believe that there's a lot of uh, lessons that we can take from these different groups, these different assemblies, these different congregations of people that Yeshua himself uh, talks to and, and prophesies through, through the prophet John and rebukes even and corrects and, and warns people of how you know, we need to make sure that we're in a place in our hearts and our lives where we're falling into the right group. Well, we're a part of the group that is going to be ready for Messiah when he returns. That is going to be kept from the hour of trial and protected in the tribulation when the hard times come. Because it lists a lot of things that are going to be taking place for a lot of these different groups. And so we can learn from them. And we can study them. And we can go over them and see how it applies to you know, what we do now. And the different groups out there now that we're seeing professing believers. And so that's what we're going to get into. Amen? Amen. So, starting in chapter 2, uh, Revelation, verses 1 through 7. And it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And who is that? Jehovah or Yeshua. Amen. <laughs> um, let's see. These things says he who holds... I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have preserved and have patience, uh, per persevered, sorry, and have had patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of of the paradise of Elohim. Ephesus was one of the seven uh, assemblies of the churches of Asia that are cited in the book of Revelation. Paul started this ministry. We see in Acts chapter 19 that through his journey through Asia and Asia Minor, he began all the, the different ministries of the new believers. Um, it's, it's possible that the Gospel of John may have been written here. Uh, the city was the site for several 5th century Christian councils that were known for examining doctrine. So this, this church became, um, and I'm going to just slip up and say church a lot, so just bear with me here. Um, but um, anyway, we know what it really means. Um, 
and what I'm getting at. But this became a leadership council. This became kind of like the standard, the example of all of the different ministries that were being created and that were being uh, started by Paul and his followers and those that are with him. And, and Revelation, as we read it, states that these people hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans and that Elohim accounted that for good. A uh, quick history of the Nicolaitan people uh, is that they were a people who held to a viewpoint of antinomianism. Say that five times. <laughs> antinomianism. And this is an early doctrine in Christianity um, that takes the principle of salvation by faith and divine grace to the point of asserting that the saved are not bound to follow the Torah of Moses. The distinction between Antominian and other Christian views on moral law is that Antominians believe that obedience to the law is motivated by an internal, an, an internal principle following from belief rather than any form of external compulsion. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what we see all over the body today? Isn't that what we see all over the world today? Oh, you, you're saved as long as you say you believe. You're saved as long as you have the belief and, and the confession you know, in your heart, yet everything you do outwardly doesn't really matter. It doesn't have the point to that. So they confess to be believers, but their doctrine led them to indulge uh, in behaviors such as sexual immorality, eating foods devoted to idols, and unclean meat and foods, this group of people, the Nicolaitans. So the people of the Church of Ephesus were commended for hating these deeds of Thoralessness, like they, they persecuted it, they, ri they ridiculed it. They were, they were going to be the example to the rest of the churches, so they were probably very, very um, you know, quick to hold others accountable. And if they saw these deeds, this lawlessness taking place, and they saw the profaning of the Torah taking place, then they would have called it out, and they would have been you know, harsh towards it. As they became more knowledgeable in the Word, and they became leaders of the faith across Asia, it also says that they forgot their first love. This certainly applies to us today. As Brother Paul taught on last week, how the love is growing cold in these days, especially among the believers in the movement of you know, Torah observant followers, Torah observant believers. It seems like the more that we grow and learn and knowledge, the more cold we can allow ourselves to become if we're not careful and we forget our first love. It's true. We forget that we were once in a place where we were fallen and we needed Yeshua's mercy and His grace. And because we've been in Torah for however long, three years, five years, ten years, we just get all puffed up. Yep. And we forget the one who even saved us in the first place, denying him when it comes to salvation and when it comes to being our Messiah. This is happening all too often in the body today, is it not? It is. Don't be caught up among this group. Yeshua was describing this group of people that are going to come in the last days before he returns. People who say that they're religious, people who hold fast to the word, but at the same time, that's all that they're about. It's just knowledge. It's just religion. And they forget the first love, the love of Yah. They forget about showing the love of Yeshua to the rest of the body. They're more worried about being right. They're more worried about correcting people. They're more worried about looking religious instead of showing that love on the side. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. They do not want to be a part of this group because there is a widespread play of this going on everywhere. And it saddens me. It's, it's everywhere. It's growing. The love is growing cold. It's chilling in here. Is that what he said? As Paul said last week. <laughs> All right, next one. Revelation chapter 2 still. And this time we're going to go, we're going to go, uh, Follow with verses 8 through 11. All right, so we're still in chapter 2 and verse 8. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write this. Uh, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Smyrna was one of the principal cities of Roman Asia. Smyrna uh, vied with Ephesus and uh, Pergamum for the title of the first city of Asia. A Christian church and a bishop, bishop 
bishopric, uh, whatever that is, I just you know, got it from uh, Wikipedia and Webster's Dictionary, existed here from a very early time, probably originating in a considerable Jewish colony. Again, so these were also considered to be one of the first churches and also leadership among the ministries that were started. We see the start of this uh, congregation again, like the Ephesus church uh, in Acts 19, when Paul was on his journey through Asia Minor, this church was likely to be started. It was known as a place of persecution towards believers. Probably one of the most well-known uh, persecutions was the killing of a Christian man named Polycarp. He was martyred in Samaria around A.D. Uh, 155. At Polycarp's trial, the unbelieving Jews of Samaria joined with pagans in condemning him to death. Um, and this was a well-known time of persecution. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, let's go there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. It says... Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Yeshua Messiah will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And also we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Yehovah, Yeshua Messiah, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So again, Samaria was a poor and persecuted uh, land in the physical, but it says here in scripture as we read that they were rich in the spiritual. And that they held they held fast to the... Go ahead, brother. I was curious, when you first started on each one of the churches, they said the angel. Now, are these angels from the Lord or these angels of the fallen? Uh, these are angels, I believe, from, from Yah, the messengers. Okay. So part of Yah's army, people relaying the prophecy of Jonathan. Okay. All right. Now, as for the identity of the synagogue of Satan, I'm going to cover this really quick because I see it still as a rising problem in the body. Uh, there are those that try to claim things against Israel. They try to claim this, uh, uh, you know, th this is referring to uh, the people who are in Israel today. They're not really the true... Uh, people of Judah, they're not really the true people in Israel, and this has to be false, according to Scripture. This is not true, according to Scripture, and we're going we're to go over why. Let's go to Genesis chapter uh, 49, verse 10. Genesis 49, verse 10. And I know a lot of people, you know, a lot of uh, conspiracy theorists, and a lot of people who follow a lot of, uh, you know, research that completely just to me doesn't make any sense of who the true Jews are and who, you know, the DNA studies and all this stuff. They try to claim, like I said, that um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard, you know, this kind of propaganda, but that the people in, in Israel today are not the true Jews. And I completely disagree with that. And I believe scripture does as well. And so Genesis 49.10 it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Zechariah 8.23 What is the scepter? What is the scepter that will not depart from Judah? Anybody? Is that, it's not the... What is it? Okay, if you think of a scepter and you're holding it, what does it do? It's like a light. It's like a guide, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay? So it's the Torah. It's the commandments. It's the instructions. It's Yah's word. It's His given Torah to the people. And it says it shall not depart from Judah. Who, who still holds fast to the Torah to this day? Who has held it all along? Judah. The people in Israel. Yeah. Who, do the main, who do we look to as an example for the most part? I know they do a lot of things that are not, you know, in Scripture, and they've added and taken away from different things by adding the Talmud and whatnot, but still, as a general example, who do you think Messianics look to? Judah. They're the ones that have held the Torah. They're the ones that know the commandments. Zechariah 8.23. Thus says Yehovah Sebaot. The Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that Elohim is with you. And that phrase, Jewish man, is Yehuda, uh, Yehudaim. Right, Brother Paul? Is that what we said? Yes. Yehudim, Yehudim each. So a man of Judah. 
So all of the nations from all the earth are going to look to the example of Judah, like I just said previously. They were to be the example. They were to be the ones that held the scepter. So it does not matter what you believe or what you think about the, the, the raising up of Israel in 1947, how it happened, who did it, how it came about. Yah is the one that ordained it. And Yah is the one that has allowed his people to return back to his land after all of these years to continue to be the example to the rest because of his work, because of his promise to keep a remnant of Judah throughout all of time. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 44, 28 through 29. Let's go there. Jeremiah 44, verses 28 through 29. All right, just to give you guys a quick uh, context of this. So this was a time when uh, Jeremiah was prophesying to both Israel and Judah, to all the people of the nation of Israel, okay? And he was about to uh, bring the Babylonian captivity upon them. He was about to bring the, uh, the people to, into captivity, and they became afraid. And they said, we're going to flee to Egypt. We're going to run to Egypt. And Yah told Jeremiah to tell them, do not flee to Egypt. If you stay here, if you repent in the land, then I will forgive you. I will be merciful to you. Only trust me. Do not flee to Egypt. Yet when Israel heard the prophecy of Jeremiah, they said, no, we will surely flee to Egypt. We're going to run. We're going to hide. We'll be safe in Egypt. And so Yah was displeased with this. Yah was angry at them for disobeying Jeremiah the prophet, and they all went to Egypt, and Yah punished them for it. We know the captivity that they went into and the trials that they faced, but even still, even through that, Judah was among the disobedience, but even still we read here in chapter 44, verses 28 through 29, Yet a small number who escaped the sword shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah, and all the remnant of Judah who have gone to the land of Egypt to dwell there shall know whose words will stand, mine or theirs. And this shall be a sign for you, says Yehovah, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my words will surely stand against you for adversity. So even in their punishment, even in their downfall, Yah still held fast to the promise that there would be a remnant and said that he would allow them to return to the land, even though they were disobedient. And this is because of Yah's words. This is because of his promise. It's not anything that Judah's done. This is because Yah has to be true to his word and true to his promises. 2 Kings, verses seven, uh, chapter 17, verse 18. 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 18 says, Therefore Yehovah was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. Again, this is when Israel went into Assyrian captivity, and Judah was allowed to stay in the land. And even after that, when they went into Babylonian captivity, we read in uh, Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 11. Let's go there. That he allowed them to come back. He allowed them to return back to the land. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 through 11. For thus says Yehovah, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says Yehovah, thoughts of peace and not for evil, to, to give you a future and a hope. This is Judah he's talking to here. And Ezra, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, let's go there. Same scenario, they're returning back from Babylonian captivity. chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of Yehovah by mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, Yehovah stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom, and also put in it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of Yehovah, of Yehovah, the earth Yehovah Elohim of the heavens has given me, 
and has and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people, may his Elohim be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of Jehovah of Israel, he is Elohim, which which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left any place where he dwells, let the men of this place help him with silver and gold, with goods, with livestock, besides a few little offerings for the house of Elohim, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the fathers, houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all those spirits Elohim had moved, arose to go and build up the house of Jehovah, which is in Jerusalem. Even after Babylonian captivity, Yah allowed Judah to return back to the land. So again, I went over all that. Just to emphasize that the misreading and the misrepresenting of the synagogue of Satan, of the people of Judea, the people in Israel, not being the true Jews, is false. It's wrong. And we're going to talk about who it's really talking about. This passage that we read, the people of the synagogue of Satan, is speaking of, of pretty much either Jew or Gentile, who call themselves believers, yet instead of being true to the faith, they worshiped false gods. They worship things that were not of God, especially back in that time during the persecution. There were Jews and Gentiles alike that at first claimed to be believers, but instead of holding true to the faith, they worshiped the Roman emperor and spoke out against the Christians in Samaria. They betrayed their brethren. They turned their brethren over to the Romans. They watched their brethren be crucified and, and killed and martyred and said nothing. We see people like this in, in uh, Yeshua rebuking in books like Luke. Let's go to Luke chapter 3, verse 8. Luke chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that Elohim is able to raise up children to Abraham from even from these stones. John chapter 8, verse 40. starting in verse 37. So John chapter 8, 37 through 40 says this, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Yeshua said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from Elohim. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds, verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, Elohim. Verse 42, Yeshua said to them, if Elohim were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from Elohim. Nor have I come of myself, but of he who sent me. Let's go to Matthew 23, verses 13 through 29. And this, really, this one right here, Matthew 23, really, really hits home of who this is describing in Revelation chapter 2. So Matthew chapter 23, verses 23, or verses 13 through 29. Starting in verse 13, it says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither, you're in yourself, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make a long prayer. Therefore you will receive great condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind! For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. 
fools and blind. But which is greater, the gift of the, or the altar, or the altar that sanctifies it? Therefore he who swears by the altar swears by it, and all things in on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it, and him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of Elohim, and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and, and, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the Torah, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out of gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of ex ex exhortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like a, white, a whitewashed we were like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and, and all uncleanness. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because the tombs of the prophets and the adorned monuments of the righteous. So these were the physical Jews, or people who claimed to be you know, leaders and Pharisees and Sadducees of the Torah, and they followed Torah, yet in reality, they, they didn't have God in them. They didn't have the true spirit of God in them. They kept the letter of the Torah, and they said they were Jews, but spiritually, they were not. They were not of the covenant of Abraham. They were not belonging to their father Abraham. Paul, Paul speaks to this, true spiritual Jews. In Romans chapter 2, verses 28 through 29, he says, A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he, was, if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. So this is what the synagogue of Satan is talking about, and this is what Yah is warning us against in this chapter. People, is, is, people are going to come against us in, this, in these last days. This is going to be a pattern that we see. Fellow believers, people professing to follow the word, people professing to follow Messiah, betray us and turn against us and hand us over to Satan, especially in the tribulation when the time comes and the persecution comes and people are lining up to get the mark of the beast and people are being asked, where are your believers? Where are these Sabbath keepers? Where are these commandment keepers? Where are those that have the testimony of Yeshua and keep the commandments? Other believers are going to be the ones giving us over. Other believers are going to be the ones compromising and saying, there they are. There are those, those Saturday believers, those, those Sabbath keepers, those commandment keepers, and that is what Scripture is telling us here. Amen. Be weary for this. Be ready for this. And do not be one of those people. Make sure you are firmly rooted in your faith. Make sure you are firmly rooted in the Torah because this is what's going to happen. And we need to be prepared for it. Amen? Amen. People like this are all over the place. Here in America. Over there in Israel. Like like we always say, like I hear Sister Michelle say all the time, the land is not is not keeping Torah completely right now. The land is fallen right now. And, and there are fallen people all over the world, even those who profess to be Jews, even those who profess to be believers and ministers. But they are not. They are a front. They are liars. And they're all over the place. So this has nothing to do with proclaiming that the people in Judah or the people in Israel are not the true Jews. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's go continue reading in Revelation chapter 2. Let's go back to chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And I know I really got kind of, you know, sidetracked on that topic, but it's just something that, as again, I see people trying to uh, allude to all the time. And I just, it's not, it's not true. It's a lie that Hasatan is stirring up in these last days to try to get people to turn against Jerusalem. And it's not true. Well, I don't know if I, I was a little distracted by this, but if you brought up all the wars that Israel's had since they became a nation in 1948, yeah. and how you've seen God's hand in it, it was, they won by miracles, Amen. not because, I mean, the first war they had, they had one plane, and it was physically, like, trying to drop, it was, it was ridiculous, like, they had no army, they had no military, and yet they still won, Amen. so we know that that Yah still fights for them. And Amen. his God's name is, he does it for his name's sake. Mm -hmm. And what was that? Uh, they won in six days. Yeah, six I think day it was a, a video of the day, day war. Yeah. 
Yeah. Or somebody else shared where there was like a sandstorm yeah. uh, on mm -hmm. the border of Israel. That's on like, two different videos, Miracles of Israel and uh, what's the other one? All that we have. Against all odds. What? Um, against all odds. odds. Yeah, yeah. Against all odds. odds. Yeah. Yeah. Those are two good videos. Yeah, and it's just, it's just incredible. There's video yeah. after video, testimony after testimony. On how Once you hit on one, they just keep Yeah, the, Yeah, the miracles of Israel and the miracles yeah. of Yah in Israel have been taking place since the beginning of the nation that was started. When even the Arabs were interviewed, when when they're firing missiles from Gaza into, you know, into Israel, <clears throat> that one of the Arabs was being interviewed and he was irritated. He says, "Because we'll 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 shoot a missile and we'll have our target in sight, but their God changes the direction of the missile in the middle of the air, in midair." And we're like, "Hello." <laughs> That's what do you think they pay attention? We think there was. You know, That's exactly the same kind of fear that other yeah. nations had in the Torah against Israel, yeah. against Moses, against Joshua. You had all these other nations afraid of Israel yeah. because of their God, because of Elohim. Yeah. And so this, that just shows it's confirmation. <laughs> Amen. All right. Uh, still, go ahead. Um, I would honestly think that you wouldn't hear. Yeah, because their God isn't real, or their God is, is not more powerful than ours. Amen? Alright, so chapter 2, verse 12 through 17. Alright, we're just going through these different assemblies. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works, and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith. Even in the days which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught, uh, or Balaam, who taught the Balak, to put, to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, who which the thing that I hate. Repent or Israel or well, repent or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone. And on the stone, a, a new name written, which no one knows except for him who receives it. So, Pergamum was a beautiful city and an art-filled city in the province of Asia, built along the, the tributaries of the Cassius River. Pergamum was a center for the worship of the pagan Greek gods uh, and goddesses Dionysus, Zeus, and other pagan gods. So this was literally the epicenter of the, Greece and, of the Greek and the Roman worship and the Roman gods. This is why Yeshua says that it's like Satan's throne room. This is why uh, Yeshua claims, like, I know where you're at. You're surrounded by evil. Because there would have been a lot of wickedness and a lot of darkness all around the believers there. Because of how filled it was with pagan worship and pagan idols and all the wicked things that were around them. So first we see Yeshua affirms the positive actions of this church where he says, look, I know where you guys are at. It's difficult. It's like the throne room of Satan. Yet you remain true to my name. You do not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Now Antipas is mentioned throughout history uh, as a faithful witness, and he was uh, known to be a physician uh, suspected of secretly uh, propagating Christianity or belief in Messiah. He was accused um, of disloyalty to Caesar upon being condemned to death. Antipas was placed inside a copper bull which was then heated over a fire until it was red hot. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? That, is just, that just gives me just, ugh, just thinking about it. Being placed inside of a red bull and pretty much like boiled and seared alive. I, they have that in one of those pagan god movies. They, they show that in one of those. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really disgusting. So... It would seem that the people of Pergamum lived in a difficult place, as we said, surrounded by pagan influences, and at first they held fast to Messiah's truth, to Messiah's word, and they didn't deny him during these difficult times. 
Yet after a time, they compromised and they mixed with paganism. They mixed with lawlessness. It, again, the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and we know that that was lawlessness. They were accused of being or, or following the doctrine of but the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam, uh, the teachings of Balaam. And this we find, let's go to Numbers chapter 25, exactly what the, the doctrine of the teachings of Balaam is. Numbers 25, verses 1 through 3. And it says, Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of Yehovah was aroused against them. Again, we see this in Numbers 31, verses 15 through 16. Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against Yehovah in the incident of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of Yehovah. So this is, this is compromising with darkness, and we see that all around alive and well today. The church, the body of Messiah, the bride of Messiah, unfortunately, uh, or the false bride, rather, being indulged in paganism, being indulged in Baal worship, being indulged in sun worship. And this is exactly the stuff that this scripture is talking about. And we have to remember that as time gets closer to Messiah coming back, it's going to get worse. We're going to be surrounded by evil. We're going to be surrounded by wickedness. But unlike this group of people here, we can't grow weary. We can't mix with it. We can't allow it to come into our homes or come into our lives. We have to stay set apart. We can't give in to this doctrine of, of just anti-Messiah and pagan and idolatry. Really, that's what it comes down to, idolatry in your heart. Allowing idolatry and wickedness in your heart. Allowing the things of the world to be assimilated to your life. Allowing yourself to be assimilated with all the material things in our life. And we see that, again, prevalent all over the churches today. Prevalent all over the mainstream, uh, you know, Big name pastors and churches just being dwelled in in the materialism and just mega churches, you know, having to do with more of, of material things and money rather than really truly bringing the word of God. And it's sickening and it's sad. And we have to be the example. We have to be the set apart people that call it out and not be afraid to be set apart. We can't compromise or grow weary for doing good. We have to hold on to the faith. Amen. 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 A little, not even a little bit. We can't even allow a little bit of compromise in our hearts. Because why? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Amen. So we need to become focused. Even more so. Even more so. Hasatan is going to try anything he can, any way he can, to sneak back into our lives. To sneak back into our hearts. I saw a prime example of it this just past week with some of the things Angela and I were going through. And it's just, he's just so sneaky, man. He's just so cunning and so sneaky to try and attack while, while we're not on our, on our guard or while we may be distracted or while we may have our guard down just for a little bit, just for a moment, he'll try to sneak in there and tempt you with old things. Or he'll try to attack you and discourage you and get back into your life somehow. And we can't allow that compromise in our hearts. Amen? Amen. Amen. Light has no fellowship with darkness. Revelation uh, verses 18 through 39. Verses 18 through 39, chapter 2 still. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, These things says the son of Elohim, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach you, to teach and seduce my servants, and commit sexual immorality, and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her uh, into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest of uh, Thyatira, 
as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast to what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule over them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Now, Thyatira was an ancient Greek city called uh, Pelopia at first. And during the Hellenistic era in 290 BC, it was named Thyatira. And it stood on the border between Lydia and uh, Messiah. And it was known to be a wealthy town in uh, near the Lycus River in the Roman province of Asia. Today it's modern day Turkey. Now, again, Yeshua affirms their positive actions. He says, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, and your perseverance, and I know uh, that, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. But then, uh, like the previous group, their sin is revealed. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess by her teaching. She must lead servants into sexual immorality and eating the food sacrificed to idols. Now, me personally, I, I believe that this was a representation used to used referencing Jezebel in the Tanakh, and we know that she was an idolatrous woman who opposed Yah. So I'm not so sure that there was an actual physical woman named Jezebel in, the, in this in this assembly teaching false doctrine. It, I, I personally believe that it's it's a a resemblance, a representation pointing back to this group of people allowing false teachers to come into their congregation and mislead the people. Allowing false teachers to come into their congregation and teach that it's okay to be sexually immoral or it's okay to give in to these indulgences and not follow the Torah and the commandments and life of obedience. And we see this so prevalent today again still with the body of Messiah all over the place. False teachers rising up, becoming more bold, and teaching things that are completely against Yah's holy scriptures and against Yah's holy word. Just like the other day, um, Sister Paul and Brother Michelle shared on, on social media. <laughs> Man, I Sister that. Paul <laughs> and Brother Michelle? Yeah. Did I say that? Yeah. yeah. Do I look like a girl to you? Other way around. <laughs> Brother Paul, Sister Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Paul and Sister Michelle. You're fired. Shared on social media. All right, I gotta go. Oh. <laughs> I'm so confused. <laughs> there is no gender confusion. What I was here. getting at. Sorry, Anthony. What I was getting at was the the, the, the pastors on social media uh, presenting to the body of believers these what were they, the Tetris cards and the Ouija board, yeah. Christ, Christian Ouija board. Oh, the board, angel cards. And Christian angel cards that are supposed to be like the the tarot, the, the tarot cards. Yeah. And it's like. Yeah. It's, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Well, they said they said they're not tarot cards, right? They said they're not tarot cards that they created them themselves. And it's like, what? Well, you're you're, For you're what div this? this is divination. Yeah. Yes. This is what God says yes. not to do. That's right. And it's not you're not supposed to go to cards and these things to find out what your future holds. That's wrong. It's fortune telling. No matter how you look, you can call it whatever you want. It's fortune telling. You might as well walk up to that sheet music stand there and ask it. To, Guide you. Yeah, there you go. There, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I just like again, it's just it's so it's so prevalent. It's spreading like a plague, especially in these last times. Man, these wolves uh, in sheep's clothing, they're gonna they're gonna continue to pop up all over the place. And we cannot allow ourselves to be afraid to speak out against them. That's the sad thing, is we have people in the churches and in the body just accepting it. Just saying, oh, okay, it sounds good. Let's, let's go ahead and let it in our church and, and, be, and be taught from our pulpit. Homosexuality ministers being allowed to teach from the pulpit, being ordained as ministers. And they are in their sexual sin. It's wrong. Yeah, it's and we cannot be allowed to speak against it. Wickedness and hostile is wrapping up. Just this boldness and this blatant, just not caring, and out in the open, all over the place. And the people of Messiah need to rise up and, and not be compromising and not stay quiet. And not like this group of, of this church, just stay quiet and allow it into the, into the congregation mm -hmm. and Amen. not say anything. That was this group's fault right here. Mm -hmm. That was this assembly's fault right here. This is what Messiah had against them. That they allowed that spirit of Jezebel, that spirit of sexual immorality, that spirit of adulterous and idolatry being taught, come into their congregation and share and to mislead the people. We cannot allow that. 
we have to speak up. Go ahead, brother. I was going to say that uh, Toys R Us has the right. demon boards and they're selling them. But the sad thing is, not just the kids are getting them, but the young adults are buying them. Yeah, it's, it's all over the place, man. It's crazy. Um, how much how much is spread? And just, I, I, I'm not, I, I swear, it's like, there's no, it never ceases to amaze me. Just the, the next thing that's coming out. Like the whole, um, the, what we just talked about, the Tetra cards and the Ouija board being preached by a minister calling himself a Christian. It's like, yeah. what the heck? Like, how is this even possible right now? Like, I never thought I would see that, ever. Mm -hmm. Not even in my generation. Yeah. Yet it's happening. They're promoting mm -hmm. it. They're saying it's okay for believers to take part in. And that just shows where we are at in the timeline of when Messiah comes back and where we are at with all these things. It's just, it blows my mind. But at the same time, it's exciting because we know that it's drawing near to the time of the return of our Messiah. Amen? Amen. 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 Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of Elohim and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before Elohim. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon as a, come upon you as a thief, in the, in the, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Sardis, it was one of the oldest and best defended cities in the region um, and the wealthy capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia. Again, Yeshua quickly condemns the state of the Sardin, the Sardian church. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. So you once were believers. You once knew me. You heard my word. You know the truth. But now you are dead. But now you have allowed these dry bones to come upon you and you have given yourself over to a slumber and into a sleep. How many believers do we see that happen to, especially these days? But we, they, we know they know the truth. We know that they were raised in the Word. We know that they were raised up to be believers. But for some reason, something happens to them in their life. Whether it may be a, a, a separation or a divorce or a losing of a loved one or something of that nature, life circumstances have just caused them to just go over into the slumber and to give up the life and the joy that Yah has given them. And even though they know the truth, they allow themselves to just go to sleep spiritually. And Yeshua tells them here, wake up. Go back to what you once knew. Go back to the truth before it dies. It's inside of you. It's still there. And it's dying in you. Don't let it die. Look, listen, anybody listening on social media, I don't care what's happened to you or what you've gone through or what you've done, the mistakes that you've made. You know Yah's word. And you know it to be true. And we cannot allow ourselves to stay in a slumber. We cannot allow ourselves to stay spiritually asleep because we don't want to be caught like a thief in the night when Yah comes back. We don't want to be caught off guard. And that's what's going to happen. We're going to allow ourselves to be spiritually sleeping. And when he returns, we're going to be completely caught off guard. Amen, Anthony. And we don't want that to happen. Amen. Nope. Did you want to say something, Brother James? No, I was just saying, uh, agreeing with you. We don't want that to happen. Amen. All right, let's keep reading. Uh, Revelation 3, verses 7 through 12. Of all, the, of all the assemblies that we're reading about, this, this right here, this one that we're getting ready to go over, is, is, is what I pray that I would, I would be found worthy enough to be a part of. That, about we, we, that we would be found worthy enough yes. to yes. be a part of right here. Yes, yes, you know, yes. And even, even though through all the different uh, assemblies that we're reading about, Yah still offers a hope. He says that you will still be kind of worthy. You will still get a white garments if you repent and come back to me. They're going to have to go through chastisement. They're going to have to go through tribulation and suffering to be purified 
And they're going to have to go through things that are going to either force them to fall away completely or force them to cry out to Yah. But this group right here that we're getting ready to cover, the, the Assembly of Philadelphia, Yah calls faithful. Yah calls worthy to be, to be kept from the hour of trial. And I pray, I pray, Abba, that you would call us worthy. Everyone here would be called worthy. Of his, of his word and worthy of his protection, that Psalm 91 protection, that when everything is going on, when all the persecution starts, when we enter into the tribulation, that we have that Psalm 91 protection, that we may see thousands fall at our side and 10,000 at our right, but the harm will not come near us. We pray for that over ourselves. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go uh, seven, chapter verse 7. It says, And to the angel of the church of uh, Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for I have, for, for you have a little strength. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Oh, man, I pray, Father, give us the strength. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So all of those people out there, as we covered earlier, who are professing to be of Yah, who are professing to be believers, but are not, but are truly wicked and evil and turn around and hate us, the believers, he is going to make them come and bow down at our feet. The true worshipers will rise up. The true believers will rise up and receive the praise. Amen. Because you have kept my command to preserve, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, and that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my Elohim, and he, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my Elohim. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Man, again, hallelujah, I pray that we would be found worthy enough to be a part of this assembly, worthy enough to be a part of the bride. I believe this points to a picture of the bride, that we would be found worthy enough to be protected in the hour of trial. Philadelphia was a city in Asia Minor, uh, again, modern-day Turkey on the Imperial Coast Road, who encourages the believers regarding his future coming. He says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world. Now, a lot of, a lot of believers try to claim that this is a supporting of the rapture, pre-tribulation rapture, but I don't believe that. At all. I don't believe that that supports the rapture at all because to me I think it's a similar pattern that we see the Exodus in Egypt. When the Israelites, when they went through all of the plagues and all of the things that Egypt that fell upon Egypt, Yah kept them from those plagues. They only endured one plague, but for the majority they were kept in Goshen. They were kept away from all of that disaster. They were kept away from it. And similarly, I believe this is what Yah is pointing to. We're still going to be here because, again, it says that we're not going to be taken up until the sound of the last trump when Messiah comes back. But while we're going through the years of tribulation, through the times, through the persecution, he says he will keep these from the hour of trial. He will protect them. He will keep them in Goshen. He will protect them from the harm coming upon them. Go ahead, brother. Does that mean we're going to be raptured out? <laughs> no, that's what I just said. Uh, you know, I just... <laughs> were you not listening? Apparently I missed that part. <laughs> That again, yeah, this, this is not proclaiming that we're all going to vanish and poof in thin air before the things start. No, we're going to be here. I believe Yeshua is promising protection. I meant Yeshua that as a joke. Is, pro is promising to be kept from that harm that we're going to see fall upon the wicked, that we're going to see fall upon the believers who need to be refined, the believers who need to be purified before that they can receive their white robe. Amen? Amen. 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 Yeshua provides a final promise to the, the believers of Philadelphia, to all believers uh, who overcome. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of the city of my Elohim. And never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim, the New Jerusalem, 
which he is coming, which is coming down from heaven for my Elohim, and I will also write on him my new name. Man, oh, I cannot just 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 think about that for a second. When the return of Messiah comes, he finds us worthy after being protected, after all the chaos and all the all the destruction that's happening from the world. We this group right here is gonna see Yahoo so mightily during the tribulation. This group right here is going to be a part of the group when things are just going all to hell. And hell is breaking loose. And they are going to see the hand of Yehovah Yeshua move like we haven't seen since the time of the disciples. Like we haven't seen since the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when Yehovah Yeshua appeared right before man. That is coming. Amen. And we are going to see that. This group is going to see that because they are going to be kept from the hour of trial. They're going to be protected during this time. And oh, Father, please, I pray. I pray that I will be found worthy to be a part of this assembly. Amen. To be the example to those who are losing their mind because everything is going so array. And they look to a group of people and say, why are you being protected? Why are you being kept? Why are you so bold and so strong? And God is with you. Let me go with you. This is that group. And Father, please, I pray for all of these people here and in the body to wake up and be in, and, and strive every single day to have the heart, to have the, 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 the upright heart, the new heart, the pure heart, to be a part of this group. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Last one. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And it says, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea. How did you say this? Laodicea. Laodicea. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Sorry for those online. We were kind of having a Laodicea. This earlier. Oh, Leo, Laodicea. And to the angel of the church of Leo of the Laodiceans. Okay, so it's plural. Uh, right. These things says, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of Elohim. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold nor hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Wow. Mm. <sighs> Man, that just that's, that's that hurts to read that. Yeah. Gosh. That's terrifying. That's beyond terrifying. That, that's, yeah. that's even, the definition get of that close and then miss the boat. That's bad. To think of to think of Yah. Saying to look to me. to look at you like your vomit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that's just that's terrifying. No wonder that's your right. insides will turn to water just standing before him. Mm -hmm. yeah. It would be better never to have existed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. It would be better never to have existed than to experience this yeah. standing before to our be, king. Damn. To be rejected. <laughs> because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on, sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. And even with the history of Laodicea, it was a wealthy and industrious city in the city of province of uh, Phrygia in the, in the Lycos Valley. And it describes just the people being lukewarm, neither hot, neither cold. People who 
are just so lost and so caught up in their self-indulgence and in their pride that they think they have nothing wrong with them. And I believe that this pertains to everyone, believers and unbelievers alike, ministers and regular people in the congregation. This is all people who just think that they are just so self-righteous and just so you know proud of their accomplishments and so fixed on the things of the world that they think that everything is all right. And they don't even see their own sin. They're blind. They have scales over their eyes to their own sin. And when they stand before Messiah, he's going to spit them out of their mouth. I, that is scary to say the least. That I, can, I cannot even imagine. We are to pray for people in this assembly. We are to be the example for people in this assembly because Yeshua even tells them, repent and come to me and I will give you a white wedding garment. Wow. A white wedding garment is waiting for you if you just repent and come back to me. Right. That is the message that he gives even the lukewarm. It is never too late. Right. We all still have the chance to come back to him. Amen. No matter what we've done, no matter where we're at in our lives, we still have the chance to receive our garment and at least even be a guest Amen. or a part of the bride. It's on us. It's what this message that Messiah gives to us. Those I love, I rebuke. These are going to have to go through a chastening. Yeah. These are going to have to go through a fire and a purification. And that, even that scares me of what's coming. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be protected in the tribulation. I mean, my, at least my flesh wants to be protected in the tribulation. Either that or just, just kill me early in it. You know? and, I don't, and I don't want to die like some big rock falling on me. Like, let me go out proclaiming Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Be like Amen. Just Amen. a martyr proclaiming yeah. the name Jesus. of Messiah. Yes. You know, not some car falling on top of me and letting me die like that. No. Yes. Either protect me the whole time, Father, please. Find me worthy to be kept from that hour. Or just allow me to be kept in the captivity and killed just like the, the other group we read about. Amen. But we have to decide. Yeah, no choking on a piece of meat or something. I, that's what I was <laughs> praying. No so choking on a piece of meat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we have to decide. Where do we want to fall in? Scripture gives these assemblies for a reason. Scripture says that these will be on the earth before Messiah returns. He categorizes every group with intentions of showing his people, where do you fall in line? And so we have to ask ourselves, we have to do a heart check daily. Where do I fall in line? Do I fall in line with the lukewarm who Yah is going to spit from his mouth like vomit? Do I fall in line with the church that's compromised, the assembly that's compromised and was once on fire for him but's allowed myself to be assimilated with material things in the world and have lost my way? Do I fall in line with the assembly that was on fire for Yon for his word but something happened to me or some circumstance caused my just faith to just die and put me into a spiritual slumber? Where do I fall in line? We need to figure that out and we need to get right with God before He returns. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.